Hi everyone, and welcome to another Living Bridges conversation. The Living Bridges conversations are a series of conversations about the relevance of empathy and the principles of nonviolence in social change. Today, we'll be speaking with Ted Rao, who's a sociocracy consultant and trainer. Ted is the organizational leader of Sociocracy for All, a nonprofit that offers training and support in implementing sociocracy and is also the author of the Sociocracy Handbook, Many Voices, One Song. Thank you so much, Ted, for joining us. Thank you, happy to be here. So to start with, maybe you could start by telling us a little bit about what is sociocracy and what does Sociocracy for All, your organization, do? Mm -hmm. So sociocracy is a governance system. Um, it's basically all, a collection of all the tools that we need to make decisions together. So. Um, how do we make decisions? How do we decide who decides? And how does that all go together? Basically also, how does information flow so that everybody has the information that they need um, in order to decide? And there are a bunch of principles that we use around that. One is the principle of consent. So decisions are made together if there's no objection. So we're not talking till everybody is like loving the proposal. We're talking till everybody says, yeah, okay, that's, that's good enough. Uh, so that's one of the key pieces. Another key piece is that we try to distribute decisions so that it's not one group that makes all the decisions, but instead we try to find a home for all the decisions so they can be made in different groups. That then know exactly like this is what we're in charge of, this is what we do, we know about this, and we're the decision makers on that. So it's a very empowering way of making decisions for those groups. And then we have a way of connecting those, making sure that the group that decides about this thing A is connected to the group that decides these things B, and then um, so that they can align everything um, with each other. So that's what sociocracy is. Um, and what sociocracy for all does is we're a nonprofit um, really operating globally uh, based in the US though. And we, um, I guess, it ties into the story of how it was how it was started. I'm one of the co-founders with my colleague Jerry, and we wanted sociocracy really to be accessible to everybody. Because back then, when we started, it was kind of a bunch of people that knew about it, but there wasn't all that much information out there. Um, it was expensive to hire a consultant, so it was kind of under lock and key a little bit. And we saw it as our contribution to everybody really to just take it and and make it accessible to everybody and accessible in terms of you know just accessible language um of course affordability uh, just in all the different ways make it easy for people to tap into that because it's something we wanted everybody to have the option of knowing about at least You said um, sociocracy is about who decides who decides or how do we make decisions. And uh, I notice that very often, whether it's in our organizations, whether it's in communities or informal groups we're in, there are sort of assumptions about how we make decisions and they're, not, they're very implicit. They hardly ever explicitly laid out. And yet most of us seem to follow a certain pattern or a pattern of assumptions around who decides. How does sociocracy um, you know, how does it help to name these, uh, name this decision about who makes the decisions? Um, yeah, this is a, this is a big deal. Hold on. How do I find my way into this big topic? So one thing I want to say is, yes, first of all, I agree with you. Yes, it's a, it's, we all have sort of assumptions. They differ from place to place. And that's a little bit of a thing, right? Because, okay, sometimes it's the founder. And while, for example, the founder might say, oh, we make all the decisions together, there can be, for example, a, a dynamic that everybody is basically reading the founder's mind because they have to. That's, you know, like even though the founder might tell me, oh, everything is decided together, right? If I, if, if I talk to the other people, then they're like, yeah, you know, we basically say what he, th you know, because he's the boss, right? <laughs> like, so there's a lot of implicit as he was saying, a lot of unacknowledged things and unacknowledged is always a gamble, right? Mm -hmm. It can be okay and it can be totally, um, yeah, it can be totally toxic. So what we do is we basically, yeah, bring all those things in the open and say, okay, let's have, I mean, it's simple as let's make a table on who decides what. That's one of the things we do of just like, let's just write it down. Is that what you understand? 
And there are two things that are happening, and that's actually quite interesting in my work. I enjoy that. Is a part of it is uh, just descriptive. Part of it is sitting down with people and say, let's come up with an accurate description of how you make decisions and who decides what. But some of it is also, and I, that sounds a little bit, I don't, I kind of want to pair the, the terms descriptive and prescriptive, though prescriptive sounds a little harsher than I would want it to, but kind of deciding together, okay, how do we want to make decisions, right? Who do we want these things to be decided by? Um, so that we come up kind of with a table that takes the good of what people are already doing, what kind of came naturally with added clarity of, oh, this wasn't actually clear, or we actually don't want the founder to decide that alone. Let's distribute it in a way that we like. So it's kind of both end of that. Um, and that that conversation is typically um, liberating to people of just like, oh, finally we know, you know, finally it's written down and I might disagree, but at least it's clear and I'm not tiptoeing and guessing and wondering and so on. You're also an NVC practitioner. How do these two practices, how do these two philosophies complement each other in your experience? Yeah, oh, so much. Um, let me, yeah, I'm gonna say several things about that. So one is um, that while NVC is so, so strong in, in deepening relationships, right, and communicating, um, it doesn't really help us um fully to bridge the gap um kind of from you and i talking or let's say a small group to groups of groups talking because when groups of groups talk to each other then we're not necessarily talking as just us but kind of also wearing the hat that we wear so for example if i'm talking to my team yes i'm talking as ted but i'm also talking of operational leader and so it's, it doesn't account for, for the roles that we are in and how, you know, how does the bookkeeper talk to the operation? Like how, how, do, how is that connection? And it, and that requires a little bit more systems and so on that, that we would have. So I always say, and I, you know, that's kind of a little bit like being, um, bring a message that might not be a super popular opinion, but though I know it speaks to a lot of people in the NBC world of, being a good communicator one-on-one -on -one does not necessarily translate mm -hmm. into being good in that um, institutional place. So there's, um, or my slogan kind of in the sociocracy world is you can't run an organization on good intentions. Mm -hmm. You just can't because there's more to it, right? Um, or another way of saying it, there are systems that kind of work in the interpersonal space and there is a different set of systems that works in the institutional place. Um, that said, one could even say that sociocracy is basically NVC translated for organizations because what we do is, uh, for example, um, let's see, what is the best example that I can come up with? So one is that, for example, if we make decisions by consent, right, we make sure that, that nobody has a, a, um, an unmet need that we, that we really want to consider. So we're not going to just override it and say, oh, it's not working for you. You know, tough luck. We're more than you. So therefore, therefore, you're just going to deal with it. So we're trying to um, be inclusive and considerate of all the needs that are present. And what we do then, for example, if we have two circles, like two teams, we make sure that two people are part of both of the teams. So they can carry information from this group to this group and vice versa. And the the way they are chosen is one of the groups would choose that person, that link that will go to the other group, but the other circle has to consent as well to that person. So now we have kind of that mutual partnership agreement, right? Because neither circle can override the other one because they are they are equals. So it's basically translated what we would do if you and I talk to that group of group level with that mutual consent. And then those two people play that role in making sure there's alignment. So I really like the both andness that that both sociocracy and NVC bring there. Mm -hmm. Another thing is that it's kind of stepping out of right and wrong thinking, because all we do, and that's the same in NVC, right? All we do is we say, okay, we start from a place of connection. We know that everybody is doing the best they can, and we assume that people want to contribute, and we just need to find practices and practices and policies and and procedures 
that are in alignment with that. So the only um, measure is, is it working for us? There is no, this is how it should be done. This is how it can never be done. Kind of it's like what up, everything is up for grabs. Basically as a group can just decide everything they want to decide the way. So it works for them and their effectiveness and their needs are the only, the only, um, thing that really, um, you know, that, that, um, that guides that, I guess, with appropriate feedback from the outside and so on. So those deeper principles of, um, assuming that people want to contribute, assuming there's no right or wrong, but all that matters is what works for us. And so that's all the same, the same things. And in a way, I'm guessing this is the systemic way of looking at how everyone's needs matter and listening to our voices before we get to a solution. Yes, kind of on the micro level. Yes, that's a lot of um, one of the practices, for example, is just maximizing for listening, I guess. Um, when there's whenever there's a proposal, we try to really in a somewhat orderly fashion <laughs> go like, okay, first let's just make sure everybody understands the proposal, which is a little bit like a um, like a request for just do we understand each other, right? Do do you understand the proposal I'm bringing? And then yes, okay, you understand it. Great. Now I want to hear what comes up for you. That's what we call a reaction round. So we go one by one and just have everybody speak to that as a way of understanding what each other's needs are around it and, and uh, feelings. And then the next thing is, well, now I would like to hear, is this what we're doing? Yes or no. Um, so that's a little bit like an action request in, in NBC. It's really a, around those very, very same principles basically put into like a decision-making format. But I, I see the same, the same um, values and principles at play. Mm -hmm. So there's something I've heard from several people around, if we were to listen to everyone, it would take a lot of time and it would be most inefficient. How does that work in sociocracy? Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's to me, that's actually, that's a great starting point kind of to talk about sociocracy because many people, when they say, oh, I wanna be as inclusive as possible, they imagine, you know, if I ask people like, you know, like just without kind of cold, but if I ask them cold, what's the most inclusive way of making decisions? They would say, oh, put everybody in the same room, have them talk, and have them come up with a decision that everybody agrees with, you know? But then it's like, okay, and then I typically, I, sometimes I just play that game in trainings and I just wait. And then typically somebody will say, yeah, but that's not gonna work because not everybody's gonna be able to speak if we have a group of a hundred people. So it's like, yeah, I guess that doesn't work. And also um, then is it gonna work for the people who don't want to sit there for six hours and talk about this one thing? So how inclusive is it really, right? Our first, our first intuition is, oh, everybody until they agree, yay, you know? And then we realize that's not how it plays out. And then the approach that sociocracy takes is say, okay, I guess there's one assumption we have to make that not, that not everybody loves, but I think it's the only way out of that dilemma. And it is that not everybody is deciding on everything. But people decide about the things that, they have, that they're most involved in. And sociocracy, the word actually translates into uh, governance by those who associate together. So those who work together decide together. So why would I decide how the snowplow team, in my case, does the snow plowing? I'm not involved. Let them decide it. So I might give them feedback and say, hey, you know, could you plow my path a little wider or whatever, you know, like, but still it should be in their hands to, to make the final decision and how they go about it. So back to your question, yes, it would take a lot of time. That's why we don't do it. We don't decide everything with everybody. We chunk it, put it into circles and say, you guys decide. But then, and that's kind of one cool thing that I like about it, then we kind of bring everybody's voice back in because we say, well, you're a decision maker, you guys decide the snowplow, but we want you to hear feedback from the outside. So it's through feedback that everybody's voice comes back in and yet we have clarity on who decides. And it's that separation that to me is kind of the magic sauce of sociocracy, mm -hmm. that separation between decision-making and feedback. So rather than seeing inclusion as an all or nothing, we could be more um, 
we could think about it more consciously in the sense of who needs to say something about this, who may be impacted by this, and therefore follow that to look at who gets to make the decisions. Right, and there's, I guess, two things about that. One is that we, um, we sometimes have to trust that people will go to the people that they know should be heard on this. Uh, for some people, they don't, they don't trust that so much. You know, would somebody go to the person that I know is 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 opposed to what I want to do? Um, and the other one is to say, okay, maybe we just kind of predefine without setting up up domains, right? Like, who do you need to ask? Who's going to decide, and so on. And I guess sociocracy is compatible with both of those, you know, like how much you want to put into boxes and how much you want to trust that people will go to the actual places where they will hear the relevant feedback. Um, that is something that you can design in your particular implementation. Uh, in one of our earlier conversations, I was speaking to Duke, Duke Duksha, who was talking about how sometimes our systems make it hard for us to collaborate with each other. And to me, this sounds like a system that makes uh, that leaves me more open to the idea of collaboration because I know that it's going to come back to me for feedback at some point. So I'm trusting that what I have to say matters, even if I'm not sitting there making the decision with the team that is. Yeah, and people have different levels of trust you know like for you that sounds like you'd be open to that some people go into complete freak out mode about that mm -hmm. um and i think that's also a place and that would be relevant to say here i think uh, everybody brings kind of just like everybody has stories and 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 past experiences even trauma about interpersonal relationships the same is true for institutions but they're different so some people walk into an organization assuming they will not be heard. And no matter what happens, that will remain their basic assumption. And that is really hard. That's hard because you, there's nothing you can do to, to show that that's not, the, that's not the only story. Because, you know, like, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of um, hurt just guiding people's, how people behave. Um, so sociocracy is not, and that also ties in with social change, right? It's sociocracy is just a system that kind of levels the playing field. It is not a strong enough tool to undo the biases and the hurt that we have. So it always needs to be combined with something that looks at that. It's just a governance system. It's not a heal everything for everybody all the time kind of system. It's really just governance. So we're very much aware that it's one part of the puzzle and there are other parts of the puzzles that are needed. Uh, we talked a little while ago about the idea of listening to all voices. What is the benefit that an organization or a community would have by actually making space for all voices to be heard? So many, right? One is that people might have key information that you might not have, right? That's a lot talked about a lot in, in organizations that people on the top don't actually know what is needed, how, how things work. Um, so just having having the information. And the other one is for me about engagement. Um, I recently came across just yet again, a study that was studying why people quit jobs. And apparently, I think the highest reason, if I'm not misremembering right now, is because they don't have a sense that they're being heard. So, I mean, listen to your people, even just if it's just for your retention rate, you know, that's already a good enough reason. Um, and yeah, but there's also another thing I want to say on that one, because it's to me, it's a little bit of a, what do I want to say? It's something that I'm very sensitive to when people say, oh, and that's not at all what you said, you you know, you were talking about listening and so on, but sometimes people say like, oh, we want people to feel heard. And just that phrase, it's like, ah, you know, that to me just sounds like cosmetic measures to give people the illusion that we actually care. And that's just, that's not where I'm putting it. You know, it's just like, no, we want to create places where people are heard. And that that is the key thing for me. 
Yeah, and another thing is, um, and that to me, that's kind of my social change angle, at least part of it, is we spend so much time in our organizations. So, and some people have this logic of, oh, you know, like at work, I basically do the things that I have to do. And then I have my life outside of that. And I'm just longing for a place for more people where that's where that's connected, right? Where I can be myself at work and people people that I talk to, they matter to me and I matter to them and what we do matters to us and just having more of an integrated life. So to me, listening to each other and getting to know each other as people also just makes the time that we spend more worthwhile if we're spending it together anyway. Whether it's small groups or large ones, how can we begin to grow our capacities to uh, make decisions collectively? How do we grow our capacities, <coughs> excuse me, to make decisions collectively? Hold on one second. Um, well, <clears throat> well, to me, it's one of the things that we have to kind of accept, at least something that it is, something that I've accepted, is that um, there's there are a lot of things going on at once when we're in a group and making decisions together. And to me, I'm choosing a system like, for example, the consent process of clarifying questions, reactions, consent. I'm choosing that constraint because I know it will help me. And not everybody is ready for that. And that if I had one message that I could magically make, you know, put into everybody's head, it would be that of just, how about you just follow a system? because it will help you. So um, so I think our capacity can grow if we just kind of system systematize things and kind of follow those patterns, right? Of like, let's first understand each other, then let's hear each other, and then let's decide to, together. Um, that to me, that would go a long way already, actually. The rest is kind of, the rest is details, you know, but that's, that's the foundation for me. You talked about consent-based systems, right? Uh, what is, how would you describe a consent-based system? What is a consent-based system? So we make decisions if nobody has, a decision is made when nobody has an objection, basically. And that gets a little technical, but really, um, because what is an objection is in the next question, right? And then I'd have to say, well, in sociocracy, an objection is when you have reasons to think that what you're deciding goes against your aim. What's an aim? Well, an aim is the thing that you said you would do together. So basically, it's kind of a kind of resting on three concepts. But the short version is a decision is made if nobody thinks there's any harm. Um, and that is, for some people see it as a kind of a low, low level, you know, like, oh, okay, no harm. Is that good enough? You know, like, and that's another phrase that we use, if, like a decision, like a consent, if it's good enough for now, safe enough to try. And to some people that's like, well, that sounds like a very low bar. And I don't see it that way, actually. Um, to me, consent is... defaulting to yes just let's just try it there's no reason not to do it how about you just do it and the other one is learning by experience because if now we do something that is kind of let's say let's say we do something that's barely good enough okay as a team but then we try it out and then we learn from the experience so maybe it was even better than not doing anything right because now we learned something so Consent really only makes sense if we see it in the context of continuous learning, 
<laughs> because yeah, making a barely good enough decision, that doesn't sound so exciting to me either, but making a barely good enough decision and to get started and then iterating from there, that's where it gets exciting to me. So it's both inclusive because you can say no, and I will not override it if you object. Um, and it's, um, and it's helping us learn because we're putting something into practice that then we can continue with. How does listening make space for our collective power as groups, as organizations, as communities? As communities, okay, you're going big or you're going towards teams here? because my first impulse was to think about teams. Shall we do that first? And yes, then you can insist yes, to yeah. think on a bigger on a bigger level because I can only do that one at a time, I think. Um, listening. Yeah, I guess I wanna talk about the first moment I learned about rounds um, about eight or nine or 10 years ago. And the round, I mean, I've kind of alluded to it, but let me say it again. The practice of rounds is talking one by one by one. So we have six people in a meeting. First person starts, for example, in their reaction or with their, with their questions, and we kind of go through that. And when I was new to that, I found it just so hard. It's like, oh, you know, like every person speaks and I have an idea and I can't say it, you know? <laughs> and um, what I did was I took a piece of paper next to me and I wrote down all my ideas. You know, while other people was, were speaking, I was writing down my ideas in response. And then it was my turn to speak. And then I looked at my list and I had like, I don't know, eight or nine things written on there. And I went through it and go like, well, the first one uh, that I didn't, that's actually not relevant anymore. Number two, oh, somebody else already said that. Number three, somebody else already said that. You know, number four, I don't even know what that means anymore. You know, like, and I went through my list and out of those eight or nine things, there were maybe one or two that were worth saying. Mm. And what had I done? I had been listening to myself, right? Instead of listening to the people. And that to me was like, whoa, how much would I have said, you know, all my nine things I would have said had I interrupted people? And how much was I actually listening? And that, that's really where the light bulb went off for me. It's like, oh my God, you know, like I, that needs to be different. And now I hardly ever take notes. I just listen while somebody else is talking because I've kind of settled in that place of, okay, we're doing a round. My job in a round is just to listen until it's my turn. And that might mean that sometimes I, what I have to say is not so polished because I didn't prepare it, but at least I listened the rest of the time. And that's kind of where my priority is now. Yeah, and that I guess translates to the big, to the big picture, right? How many times do we scream because we didn't actually take in like we misunderstood you know we didn't ask for us like wait what did you mean like i didn't quite understand it yet and all the things that so, uh, that nvc is so good at right um coming from a place of curiosity and so on like making that a practice also in our organizations that's to me what it's about and i guess also in a structured way it makes space for those who might be hesitant to speak up in a group the person who might be sitting silently all through a meeting and yet have something valuable to contribute. Right. And that's, I guess, where rounds are just a strategy, right? Because it might not, I think it works a lot. It's a great strategy, but it's also not a 100% cover everything strategy. It works really well for people like me who have to slow down a little bit, you know, and listen more. And it works really well for people who wouldn't speak if they weren't actively inviting and it's kind of the expectation that everybody speaks. It is sometimes, I think there's a small group of people that it's not so perfect for and that's people who get nervous because now they like, they have their turn and now everybody mm -hmm. looks at them and now they have to say this one, like that's their one place to shine kind of, or time to shine kind of thing. So for certain subsets of introverts or whatever you want to call them, it's a little tricky. And what we found is that we just, you know, we just adapt of, for example, I've had people like that in groups and they express that it's not working for them. And what we did was they always speak first or they always speak last. So, you know, some people can't listen if they know they have to talk next and like, oh my God, I, I will have to say something. I can't even focus. And then we just have them go first. Mm -hmm. 
so that so again it's a strategy just like things that, like i mean the the nvc term of a strategy here so we can just tweak it if it's not fully working but as a as a um default it's a pretty good strategy and then you can go from there I want to come back to this bit about um, listening being connected to our collective power, especially in communities. Uh, could you speak to that? Yeah, thank you. Um, but what I'm excited about is to create spaces where people can self-organize and organize around their needs. Um, in a way that's aligned with their values. That's that's why I'm involved in sociocracy. That's why we called it sociocracy for all, not because we say everybody should do this, but we wanted everybody to have the option of doing it. Um, because there's so much power in people knowing what they need, right? And being able to collaborate or organize together to meet each other's needs more effectively. So sociocracy as a tool for that, um, just has so much potential to unleash that power for people so they don't get bogged down by power gains or all those different things that happen in groups. Um, and ultimately, I would say sociocracy is very much embedded in a theory of change where there's just so much more engagement in local communities on the grassroots level. Uh, that's, that's where it belongs. I'd like to bring this conversation to a close now before we do any any last comments you'd like to share. So one thing I want to say to feel complete is just a reminder that sociocracy as a tool set is, is a strategy and you know, a very kind of complex strategy with many pieces. And sometimes people's first reaction is kind of like, whoa, you know, like that's already a complete strategy and like, do I want this? And sometimes people have it like an adverse reaction to that. And what I want to say is that I think sociocracy, the way we see it and the way we practice it and teach it, it's an offer. Like, how about you use this? Because not everybody needs to reinvent, reinvent the wheel. And maybe this is a, strat a set of strategies that you wouldn't have been able to come up with just because, you know, when we... Um, we can learn so many things from different places. And this is like a distilled best of version. But that said, so I don't want people to throw it out just because they're like, oh no, I can reinvent my own system, right? It's like, yeah, how about you just go with something that already exists? I see so many groups basically reinventing sociocracy. It's like, okay, just go look at it. Anyway, but the other piece is also to be an agent in your own governance system, right? Nothing should ever be done just because sociocracy says it. Like, that's not a good reason, you know, like do it because you want to do it or do it because it works for you. And if not, go tweak it. That's kind of that both and is sometimes hard for people to grasp how I can both say this is how I think it should be done and you should do it the way you want to do it, but in that healthy balance. Yeah. Now I'm complete. Thank you. And thank you for speaking to us today. Uh, I've enjoyed this conversation and I'm hoping that those who those who are watching this will get quite a bit out of it as well. Um, this is a Living Bridges conversation. And for those of you who are watching, this is part of our fundraiser uh, that we're holding to support the Living Bridges program for 2022. You'll find the links in the description. So please contribute to help us keep this program running and we'll keep bringing you more of these conversations over the next couple of weeks. Thank you so much, Ted, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me and good luck with the fundraiser. Thank you.